Okay. So good evening and welcome. My name is Callie McCune and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Indiana Historical Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you to History Happy Hour Wedding Fashion and we're so excited to have you here tonight. This happy hour is brought to you with support from Lake City Bank, offering online banking, mobile banking, and an actual go in the branch banking. You can drop by at lakecitybank.com and we're really um, appreciative of Lake City Bank to help us bring these happy hours to you each week. At the Indiana Historical Society, we are Indiana Storyteller, connecting people to the past. We do this by collecting millions upon millions upon millions of pieces of paper that tell Indiana's unique stories. These are things like books and paintings, letters and photographs, di and diaries, um, so much more and then finding intriguing and unexpected ways to share them, whether that's through publications, exhibitions, or events like this. It is through these pieces that we tell the diverse, unconventional, even saucy stories of Indiana and inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. When I get the opportunity to dig around in our collection, I'm often trying to find patterns across time or traditions that link Hoosiers from 1816 to 1961 and or 1861 and everything in between. Um, one of those things, the patterns that come up time after time are um, weddings and those life cycle events that come with them. And so I'm excited to dig into multicultural wedding fashion tonight and look at how those styles evolve, especially on this week where statistically more people get married than any other week of the year. That's your little tidbit that you can go tell your friends tomorrow. So before I introduce Reagan, our moderator, I have a few piece of logistics. Hey, Karen, can you go two slides ahead for me? So for this event, Reagan and Karen will talk for about 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll open up to your questions. Go one more for me, please. There we go. Oh. Back there. <laughs> um, so if you do have questions, um, we would love it if you would put it in the question and answer section that's at the bottom of your screen. We'll keep an eye on those and we'll ask as many as we can in the second half of the program. You are all muted tonight, but we do want to hear your voices. Please feel free to put comments in the chat section as we go. Just make sure you're replying to both panelists and attendees so everyone can see your reply and keep an eye on that box. We'll be putting in links and URLs as we go so you can dig more into this information. Don't worry if you miss one, we'll be including those links in your inbox in an email tomorrow morning. This program is being recorded and you can catch the replay at our website, indianahistory.org in the upcoming weeks. If you enjoyed this program, we hope you'll consider coming back for more. Um, we'll, in two weeks, we'll be back with History Happy Hours, exploring cemeteries with one of our favorite historians from Indianapolis, Jeannie Regan Dinius. And then keep an eye out, we have more History Happy Hours coming in the future on Kurt Vonnegut, World War I, and more. Sign up for all that at indianahistory.org and find more virtual offerings coming to an internet-connected device near you. So without further ado, I'm going to toss it over to Reagan, our education and community engagement intern to get us started. Hey, Reagan, how are you doing tonight? Hi, Callie. I'm doing well. Thanks for that tidbit. I, that's really interesting. I would have guessed it was summertime that was more popular. I would have but too. So I, I guess I've never been married. Yeah. Okay. So like Callie said, my name is Reagan. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, and with me tonight, I also have Karen DePaul. Karen is the manager of, of the local history services at the Indiana Historical Society. She's a bat she has a Bachelor of Arts in History from Quincy University and a Master of Science in Textiles, Fashion, Merchandising, and Design from the University of Rhode Island, specializing in historic fashion and textile conservation. Um, Karen has provided historic fashion and textile-based presentation and workshops around the country, as well as written two books, The House of Worth Fashion Sketches, 1916 to 1920, and The Care and Display of Historic Clothing. She currently serves as a secretary on the board of the Association of Indiana Museums and as a board member on the National Board of the Costume Society of America. Hi, Karen, how are you? Hi, Megan, I am great, how are you? <laughs> I am great. Okay, let's get into it. So um, we're here at History Happy Hour, so we always like to start out with, what are you drinking? And do you have any favorite wedding food or drinks? Of course, so I am drinking champagne. Um, because I put up some pictures because I thought it was very rude to talk about weddings and not show you a picture of mine. 
So I am having champagne because my sisters kindly sent this to me and my wife because we are celebrating our 10 year wedding anniversary um, this month. Well, I guess we celebrated it on Saturday. So I'm still downing the bottle of champagne. Um, <laughs> slow and steady wins the race, right? Okay. So I would say that my favorite food during weddings is definitely the cake because I have a super sweet tooth. But my favorite nostalgic food is those teeny tiny mints because I remember I was, my parents were very young when I was born. So I attended a lot of weddings in the early 90s and everyone had the little mints. And it was the thing that you could go over and snack on while as a seven-year-old, you were staring at the cake, waiting for them to cut it. So I always associate those tiny little mints with weddings. Yeah, the dessert is my favorite part too. I was just at a wedding, um, they had a bunt cake um, and they were delicious. It was different, I'd never seen that before. Yum. Yeah, it was very good. Okay, let's hop on into this presentation then. So in Western culture, uh, we're most accustomed to white wedding dresses, but different cultures have different colored wedding dresses. So could you talk about the significance of wedding dress colors in different cultures? Yeah, so really quickly, um, I just wanted to say that we're gonna talk about things that mostly follow culture lines today, but there'll be a couple of things that follow religious lines. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that when we talk about um, some things, we'll talk about like Eastern culture, Western culture, some of those things might be the same, whether you're a Jewish bride in America or an Israeli bride who is Jewish, or they might change because you're in a different country, but you're the same religion. So all of those things where you are and what religion you are can have a major effect on fashion and a major effect on just how you do your wedding. Um, so I just want to say that there are a lot of combinations of things that we could talk about and we're not going to get to them all. So we are going to get to some fun ones though. So when it comes to wedding dress colors, now it is very much like white. White is the wedding dress color. You know, you're crazy. You know, you always see them talking about the brides on Say Yes to the Dress that want like a blue wedding dress or a pink wedding dress and how scandalous it is. It's not that scandalous, or at least it wouldn't have been 200 years ago. Um, so white traditionally in, you know, 200 years ago in the 18th century and before, white's really difficult to keep clean. <laughs> Um, it was also really expensive to get something that was truly white because bleaching processes were not awesome. Um, and it was just, it wasn't the easiest color to get because natural color of a lot of textiles is not white. It's like a dirty, creamy color that maybe you don't want for your wedding dress. Um, so we don't really see a lot of pure white wedding dresses coming into fashion until 1840 when Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria rather um, gets married to Prince Albert in February of 1840. So here on the left, you can see a print or a painting rather of that marriage. Um, queen Victoria was a young queen and so she was definitely a trendsetter. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, even in America, looked to her for fashion, um, for kind of what she was doing. So when she wore white at her wedding, it was a big deal. And it really upped the popularity of white wedding dresses. Um, on the right hand side, you'll actually see a picture, a photograph of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. They actually took this in 1854 they rewore their wedding clothes and kind of recreated their picture because photography was not available to them in 1840 when they got married. Um, so when you see this portrait, this painting floating around, and then you see this photograph floating around, know that they're wearing the same clothes, but that was not taken at their wedding. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed she could fit in the same dress after four years. Right, right, like <laughs> let's not talk about that. I can't. <laughs> 14 years later and I'm only 10 out and that's not oh, happening. Oh, it was 14 years. Oh, I thought it was yeah, 14 years oh. later and she's wearing her same wedding dress. That is impressive. Um, yes, very. So, so yeah, so white becomes really popular and it also, it really kind of represents that innocence and purity and virginity. Um, and white remained a really popular wedding color. Um, 
it had always been popular for royalty because of the fact that it was hard to get and hard to make. But outside of royalty, women didn't really wear white until um, until kind of the middle of the century. It started taking better hold because the processes of how we got white fabric became easier and cheaper. Um, and there was also with the second industrial revolution, you started seeing, or with the, I guess the end part of the first industrial revolution, you really start to see this rise in the middle class where women have more money to spend on a dress that is harder to keep clean and going to be much less useful to them in their everyday lives. Um, so a lot of women would rewear their wedding dresses, which is another reason why white wasn't always the best choice. Um, a lot of women would wear a dress that was just kind of their, their Sunday best. Um, so a nice dress and maybe still a dress that was made of silk, but a dress that could be worn, reworn a little bit easier. Um, and that's something, you know, wedding dresses are expensive. I think most of us know that. If you've ever been married, you are aware that a wedding dress is probably one of the most expensive pieces of clothing you will ever purchase. Um, and so it's really interesting because even when you look at high society, you know, Queen Victoria did not hurt for money. But in this painting, we can see that her wedding dress was actually remade for her younger, youngest daughter, Beatrice, to wear at her wedding in 1885. So even the royalty were re-wearing their wedding dresses. Um, women, we'll talk about this a little bit if we get to some conversation about honeymoons and things, but rich women would frequently go on these honeymoon trips to Europe and they would be presented at court. And very often they would just wear their wedding dress. So even though Consuelo Vanderbilt could definitely afford a different dress if she wanted one, it was still kind of that tradition to wear your white wedding dress if you had been married into um, kind of that part of society. So another mention on the color when it comes to white dresses is I just want to make a note because this is, I, I warned Reagan I was going to get on a tiny little soapbox for a minute <laughs> um, because I love Pinterest like every other visual person. But being white does not make a dress a wedding dress. Um, by the turn of the century, especially, so by the early 1900s, white was so easy to come by. It became incredibly popular, especially in that idea of showcasing um, virginity and purity and innocence. So you'll see on the lady on the left is it's a wedding portrait. We know that it's a wedding portrait. It is labeled as such. Um, but on the right hand side, this picture from closer to around right around 1900, these two women are both wearing white or light colored clothing and white was a really popular thing for graduating seniors from high school or women who were graduating college. White was just kind of this signal of purity and innocence for young women and so not every time you see a white dress, especially post like 1880s. It is not necessarily a wedding dress. Just wanted to point that out. <laughs> so I just wanted to show you these three dresses are not in the Indiana Historical Society collection, um, but I did want to show them because I wanted to give you guys a little bit of visual since we were just talking about how not every wedding dress was white and actually white was not the most popular color. Um, so these are three dresses in the Connecticut Historical Society collection where I used to work and they're three of my favorites. So I pulled them out for this. Um, the first dress is from 1839, 1871 in the middle, and then 1888 on the right. And so you can see that these dresses would be a lot easier to wear again um, or to remake and wear again. So much easier than having a white wedding dress that you could only wear once. It's like buying a dress maybe for like a special occasion and then wearing it after that, basically. Like exactly. buy a dress for like a party or something. Right, okay. right. My my grandmother got married in 1951 and her bridesmaids, they got married in like the very beginning of January. So she just asked her bridesmaids that when they bought their Christmas dresses, that they bought velvet dresses because her wedding dress was going to be velvet. And so she had two bridesmaids. They were each wearing different dresses of velvet. I think one was red and one was green um, mm -hmm. because she wanted them to be able to wear it again. Right. They were a middle-class family. So right. 
So yeah, we still have that tradition today. And sometimes you get told you can wear that bridesmaid's dress again and rarely can you actually. So <laughs> it's nice to see that some women actually could. Right. Um, this is another picture just showing that that tradition of wearing a non-white wedding dress that we think of as the traditional wedding dress lasted far into the 20th century. Um, so this is Miss Dickerson who married Frank Beckwith in Indianapolis and they um, got married in 1951 and she's just wearing a smart little going away suit. So nothing too fancy, definitely something she can wear again. Um, one of the things that I did want to touch on is the differences for different cultures. So some, as I was saying, like white wedding dresses are very much a Western tradition. They're a Western traditional wedding dress. So Western Europe um, and America, Canada. And um, so it's a very different cultural piece. But you see, so sometimes you see women who come over as immigrants, both of these ladies who are photographed here um, were immigrants from Taiwan. And both of them chose to wear white wedding dresses. Even though in Taiwan, the cultural <coughs> wedding dresses would have been different. Um, so that's kind of where I was talking about where these women chose to go with the cultural um, of where they were at, as opposed to any kind of religious reasons for wearing whatever color of dress. Um, I will say this, I do not know what religions these two weddings took place in. Um, so I don't know if that would have had any kind of, um, it would have had anything to do with kind of what they chose, but by, choo by choosing to wear white Western wedding dresses, they're kind of showing this coming into this new country and this new culture. So with some immigrants, you see this following of the culture they come to. And with others, you see hanging on to the culture that they came from and honoring those, those cultures that they came from. So um, on the right, you see the Watanabes who really are wearing traditional dress of Japan for their wedding, um, as opposed to wearing white Western wedding clothes. Um, on the left-hand side, the gentleman, um, K.P. Singh, was an immigrant here from India. Um, he and his bride, his bride was Western. Um, she was American, but they still followed some of his religious practices when they got married and incorporated some of those things. So she's not wearing the traditional veil of a Western bride. She is wearing the traditional head covering um, of an Indian woman. So it's kind of interesting. I always find it really fascinating, especially in America because of that melting pot issue. Mm -hmm. So you see people who go, who really do these great meldings of Western traditions and traditions from wherever they're coming from. Um, this is another dress. So you will see we are switching out from the white wedding dress. Um, like I said, white wedding dresses are very Western. Red wedding dresses are the way to go if you are in India or in China or an Indian or Chinese bride. Um, red is a good luck color. So it's said that, you know, by wearing red on your wedding day, it's good luck. Um, some of the, some different cultures, and I think China and India are different in their views of what white mean, but in some Asian cultures, white is actually a funeral color. So that's the last thing you would want to wear on your wedding day. Um, so you can see this bride chose red. There are other colors associated with almost every different culture. Um, in Africa, a lot of women incorporate the bright, vibrant colors of African printed Ankara cloth. Um, Ankara is just a term for the brightly colored cloth that is dyed with um, different designs in wax prints. Um, so like this woman, those printed tears on her skirt are um, likely African Ankara prints, um, but they're African prints. And so it's the way she's kind of melding that white wedding dress top with mm -hmm. something more traditional for her at the bottom. Um, gold embroidery is also really popular in different places in Africa. 
in Africa, you see it's, it's a big continent. There are a lot of different countries and a lot of different cultures. And so almost every single one of them, you know, Nigerian brides have a penchant for one set of colors or one style of dress or one style of head covering, um, while Egyptian brides go with something totally different. So when you look at um, African bridal traditions, there is a lot of different traditions. Um, and a lot of African um, brides who are immigrants to America kind of do that melding of their having a dress like this woman has, um, who are melding kind of that Western tradition again with kind of what they're, what they're culturally used to. And then there are other countries like Eastern European brides. Um, a lot of times different villages in Eastern Europe have different kind of traditional clothing. And so you'll incorporate pieces of traditional clothing into your wedding garments. Um, and then wear those, especially in the 19th century, you would kind of get gifted and get made for you for your wedding, a full traditional what or a full traditional um, costume from your village that incorporated all of the symbolism from your village and then you would wear that for subsequent feast days or festival days in the village where you lived so yeah there's there's a lot of different yeah. traditions out there there's more than just the white wedding dress that we're used to right, right. and I like your mention of like the melding of different um cultures fashion because I think in essence that's what a wedding is right the melding of two people mm -hmm. and two lives it's kind of symbolic in more ways than one I think yeah okay. certainly yeah all right um ready for the next question ready <laughs> all right um you've talked about your different the different tra traditions surrounding bridal fashion um but there are, are there any interesting traditions associated with bridal parties there are some interesting traditions um a lot of traditions with weddings and with the bridal party go all the way back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, the wedding veil is one of my favorites. <laughs> so wedding veils were often worn by Greek and Roman women and the entire bridal party to kind of help protect them. Um, so the idea was there's, so there's speculation that part of the idea in ancient Rome, at least, was that when a woman got married, she was leaving the home and the protection of the deities who protected her parents' home, and she was going to her husband's home and would therefore, from that point forward, be protected by the deities worshipped in her husband's home. And in that span of time where she is physically going from one to the next, she's kind of in limbo and she's not protected by anybody. So it's the time when she's most vulnerable to being, um, I don't wanna say attacked, attacked is the wrong word, but I can't think of a better <laughs> word to say, um, where she can be overcome with evil spirits and have bad things happen to her. So one of the things that you would see is actually the bridal party would wear the same clothing and wear veils along with the bride to confuse the evil spirits so that they didn't know which woman was the bride. Um, so that's kind of, I think that's really interesting that, you know, the idea of a veil came from such an ancient tradition and we yeah. still do it and you yes. don't really give any thought to it. It's just like, well, you wear a veil for your wedding. I think we're getting more and more towards like more and more brides nowadays are choosing to go without a veil. My wife and mm -hmm. I, neither one of us wore a veil. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you do wear one, it's like, well, because it's tradition, you don't think about the fact that it's tradition because right. you didn't want evil spirits to attack you. Right, um, right. So yeah, so I think that's really interesting. Bridal parties have been around for ages. Mm -hmm. um, the first true bridal procession we know goes back into the 16th century. So where you know you're you're processing with your bridesmaids and your groomsmen, and it's a whole big thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I pulled up these two pictures because I just thought they were kind of fun. On the right, you can see the women are all, you know, doing that. Everybody wears the same dress. Everybody has the same little hat veil thing. Everyone has the same flowers. Everybody's the same. And I think we like to think sometimes that because it's the 21st century that everything we do is new and different and cool. And so the idea of having everybody pick their own dress that's most flattering for them is totally a new thing that we've created. Sorry, kids, it's not. 
Um, so I put up this picture from 1929 and you can see that all of the women are wearing different dresses. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, there were just as many brides having their bridesmaids wear the same dresses as not the same dresses a hundred years ago as there are today. We are not special, <laughs> we did not paint anything, but it makes for really pretty pictures. <laughs> yeah, that picture is beautiful. So are there in any interesting traditions associated with bridal accessories? I know you mentioned the veil, which is kind of an accessory, but anything else? So beyond the veil, there are some interesting things. So wearing a veil and orange blossoms specifically, um, orange blossoms have always been a traditional bridal accessory. I honestly could not find much information about why, um, but the idea of wearing orange blossoms in a crown over your veil started in ancient Greece and has continued. Queen Victoria did it. Um, flowers in, especially in the Victorian period, flowers had a lot of meaning. So what color of rose you sent somebody helped to inform them whether you thought of them as a friend or if you were romantically interested, etc. So flowers had a lot of connotation and orange blossoms in the 19th century especially were very much associated with brides. Um, so wearing a wreath of those, it even was to a point that in the 1860s, a huge industry was the fake flower industry. So especially mm -hmm. fake wax flowers, um, which having worked in a museum that has wax flowers, they are a pain in the butt to mm -hmm. preserve, but mm -hmm. they're really beautiful. <laughs> and some of them look almost as good as probably when they were made. Um, so floral crowns, totally traditional. Um, a lot of, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was, and cause I didn't know this cause I'm not one, um, Latina brides will sometimes sew into their dresses, ribbons of yellow, blue, and red to stand for the food, money, and passion that they will bring into their wedding. So it does make me wonder, I really want to ask um, Aurora up here in the picture on the right if she had those ribbons sewn in her dress. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's, you know, that's one of the traditions. We have the tradition also in Western culture, especially to do the whole something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Um, that is a Victorian rhyme that happened. And the idea was that the something old represents continuity between your past life and the life that you're about to enter mm -hmm. into. Um, something new is optimism for the future. Something borrowed is supposed to be a good luck charm from one happily married woman to another happily married, okay. hopefully happily married woman. Um, and then blue is for love, purity, and fidelity. So I think that's another one kind of like the veil, we do it. You know, at my wedding, I had all four of those things because I'm not super superstitious, but I wasn't going to mess with it on my wedding day. <laughs> but I think, you know, and then I started looking this up because I was like, I don't know what they all mean. I knew what the something old meant and the something new, but I didn't know the borrowed one. So I'm kind of like, well, dang, I borrowed a bracelet from my unmarried sister. I hope that doesn't mean anything, <laughs> but I have something borrowed. So maybe it I counts. I don't um, know. I think 10 years you're doing okay. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I have the champagne. We're good. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so there seems to be a lot of those kind of bridal accessories are, yeah, they're little things asso associated with culture and they so tend to be something that we don't even think about and don't even right. realize what they came from. Yeah, I'm loving this because I was just in a wedding and I had the same question. What does that mean? And mm -hmm. no one knew. And so now <laughs> I'm learning today. It's wonderful. Now you know okay. for next time. <laughs> right, yeah. So since weddings are usually a celebratory event, what's the history of uh, wedding festivities and how do those differ between cultures? Mm -hmm. So wedding festivities can vary greatly <laughs> across <laughs> different cultures. Um, they also vary greatly across different religions. So this is definitely one like we could have a whole thing about right. this right. Um, and the different like so much of of what there is is you know there's always some kind of day of wedding ceremony but the different little pieces and parts of that are what tend to vary so much um, but in western culture it was always traditional 
to actually I should I should say this because this is a time when this is true in Western Christian culture it was always very much the standard um, in up until the early I think it was the early 1900s um, that your wedding would take place in the morning because ceremonies in the church could not happen in the afternoon it just it wasn't there were church ball reasons that I tried to go down that rabbit hole and it was way too big so <laughs> four reasons because of the church <laughs> you would get married in the morning which would mean that instead of having these evening party receptions that we have now um brides were having you were having a wedding breakfast um most of the time that was being hosted in your family's home or in you know your family's backyard so up until about the 1940s, a lot of weddings are smaller. They're much more intimate affairs. Um, and usually what happens is you would have a, your wedding day and your wedding ceremony. That would be a more intimate event unless you happened to be extremely rich. Um, and then after that, you would have like a small intimate dinner reception or um, lunch reception or breakfast reception afterwards. And then the next day you would stay home and others could visit the happy couple and mm -hmm. kind of wish them well and wish them luck. Um, once, once churches kind of changed their stance on when you could have your wedding in the church, um, which was around World War II, we start seeing a lot more people choosing to now get married in the afternoon and having evening receptions that we think of now with dinner and dancing and DJs and all of those types of things. Um, so that's something that definitely changed. One of the things I found really interesting too is so in Western culture, now we kind of think of like everything hinges on that day up. It's all about the wedding day, that 24 hour period. Um, you might have a bachelor or bachelorette party, which apparently started, the tradition started in ancient Sparta. Who would have oh. guessed they've been around that long. Um, wow. But you would have these, but it's all kind of focused on that 24 hour period. Whereas with other cultures, it's not necessarily just about that 24 hours. So for instance, in India, um, a lot of weddings are, they can last up to two weeks. And for all of the celebrations and all of the things that you do. Um, for a lot of Indian wedding celebrations, there's kind of three main parts. Um, so there's the wedding day, which is obviously important, the day that you actually get married. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a very important part at the beginning before the wedding called the Sangeet and the Mahendi ceremony. So the Mahendi ceremony is where the bride would get um, henna on her arms, face, legs, wherever. Um, so that all happens at this very formal ceremony. Um, the Sangeet also is just kind of a general blessing of the couple preparing them for the wedding day. It's a big family celebration. Um, and then after the ceremony, you would do the reception. Sometimes the reception is the night of the wedding, the same time. Sometimes it's an entirely another celebration the day after um, or a couple of days after. So it's it always really fascinates me because I think of like buying my one wedding dress and how expensive and ridiculous that was. But Indian brides, it's not uncommon for them to need four or five wedding outfits. Um, because each one needs to be different. And the tradition of colors is different. Um, you know, red is very popular for wedding ceremonies, but you can maybe be a little less traditional when it comes to your reception and wear blue or green or pastel colors. Um, so there's a lot of kind of those things that differ. Um, there's also, like I said, the little things during the ceremony that are different and that have different reasons. Um, so in African-American weddings, there's a tradition of jumping the broom. Um, now, obviously all of these traditions are things, some people do them, some people don't. They're not, they're not necessarily a standard. So there are certain mm -hmm. things that my wife and I did not do for our wedding, even though we had a fairly traditional one. Um, if you can call my wife and I getting married traditional. But anyways, 
<laughs> whole other topic. So, um, so some African Americans will incorporate this tradition of jumping the broom, which is something that was done um, in slave culture in America. So enslaved individuals were unfortunately usually not allowed by um, their enslavers to get married. So what they would do is they would do this tradition of jumping the broom. We, I looked at a lot of sources and even scholars are not sure whether jumping the broom started with slaves and was taken back to Africa or vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. So nobody asked that question because I don't have an answer. <laughs> um, but the idea was that it kind of, you jumped into the future together and you were setting up house and a broom was something that was available to everybody. So it was something that was easy and accessible to have and you could jump over it and kind of signify that you are jumping into life together. So I thought that was really a really cool thing that, um, that people who were enslaved were able, they kind of figured out their own ways to do things mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. those traditions have stuck around. I think mm -hmm. has a lot of a lot of meaning I imagine to the people who do it that is very cool right yeah I do want to let you know you have about two more minutes just Perfect. until the question and answer part awesome so I will go really quickly then um if you don't mind Reagan I'll just kind of zoom through these last slides absolutely really quick so um another tradition is the cake um Mexican wedding cakes are usually fruit cake soaked in rum which was also, I don't know about the soaked in rum part, but the fruitcake part is also kind of traditional um, for English royalty, which is why, if anybody doesn't remember why it was such a big deal that um, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry did not have a fruitcake, mm -hmm. but that is also a Mexican wedding tradition and who would turn down fruitcake soaked in rum? <laughs> fruitcake maybe, <laughs> but soaked in rum, maybe I'd give it a try. Um, <laughs> Tiered wedding cakes also are a big thing that we think of now, but they actually didn't come into fashion until Princess Victoria, who was Queen Victoria's oldest daughter, got married in 1858. That's the first time you really kind of see tiered um, cakes. The sugar paste figures that we're so used to now, I think, you know, they're not usually made out of sugar paste anymore, but the idea of sugar paste decoration was an 18th century invention. Um, they finally kind of figured out how to make that sugar paste stick and hold. Mm -hmm. um, so those start to get really popular in the 18th century and stay really popular through the 40s and 50s um, in the United States. Photography, you know, kind of comes about with general photography, um, but it was really expensive to have your photograph taken at your wedding. So usually you see portrait photographs from until about the 1890s. That's when you kind of start seeing wedding groups posed at what looks to be the actual wedding. Um, mm. But before that, you see a lot of people who seem to be standing in a photographer's studio and that's because it was not cheap. So <laughs> either before right. or after the wedding and sometimes, you know, like Queen Victoria, 14 years after your wedding, you might head to the photographers. Okay. So. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to um, encourage everyone to um, put their questions in the chat and Q&A, but I had a quick question. Um, so COVID-19 has a, is a great contemporary example of how current events have altered wedding traditions and all of that. So do you have any other, know how any other events have changed wedding traditions in the past? Yeah, so that COVID is a great example. Um, we could have done it without it though, universe, just saying. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so with COVID, you see all these like micro weddings happening, like really kind of going back to the super intimate ceremonies where you can have six people socially distanced in a church. Right. Um, but yeah, there are always cult big cultural events always have an effect on anything major happening in society, which includes marriages. Um, during World War II, you saw a lot of gentlemen obviously getting married in their military uniforms. Um, a lot of courthouse weddings happened or quick turnaround weddings, um, not because they were shotgun weddings like we joke about them now, but because <laughs> you know you might propose to your girl and then get your deployment papers and realize you leave in two weeks and you right. want to get married before you leave. So right. there's a lot of kind of quick weddings happening in the 40s. 
um, during the Great Depression, I actually found this statistic super interesting, but during the Great Depression in the first few years, um, between 1929 and 1933, the marriage rate, rate fell by 22%. Um, but it ended up, it wasn't people who weren't getting married at all, who were like, totally, I'm not into it. Um, it was people, it was young people who didn't feel like they actually were financially stable enough to strike mm -hmm. out on their own. So it was deferred marriages. So after 1933, you start to see more couples getting married and the marriage percentage actually spikes for a little while because everybody's catching up. Because again, it wasn't because less people wanted to get married. It was just because less of them felt like they could set up a household. So mm -hmm. yeah, you definitely see changes and... Mm -hmm you know, in World War II also, like there were clothing restrictions. There were restrictions on how much fabric you could have in a garment. Granted, the restrictions were different for a wedding dress than with your daytime clothes, but there were still restrictions. So you didn't have these big poofy wedding dresses you get in the 1950s. You had slim line, very conservative wedding dresses. You saw a lot more women starting to get married again in nice day suits because mm -hmm if they were going to spend their ration money, you were going to spend it on something you could wear again. Right, right. Interesting. I know that COVID-19 isn't like Great Depression level, but I, that statistic of people waiting to get married, I wonder if that's something we'll see from now. I mean, we won't re really be able to tell probably until a little later, but it could be interesting. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> yeah. So we have a question from the audience. Pam asks, where did the throwing rice tradition come from? So I did read about that. Um, so throwing rice is another one of those that kind of started with the ancient Greece and Rome. And the, the concept of it is that it is showering the couple with good luck and good fortune. Um, and throughout history, it has been everything from rice to flowers um, to coins. So there's a bunch of different things, but basically being a newlywed bride and groom and getting something thrown at you is good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there are a lot of wedding superstitions, like throwing the bouquet, for example. Do we know where some of those superstitions come from, or why do you think some of those traditions are still around? So a lot of those traditions, things like throwing the bouquet or the garter toss, have shifted over the years, um, or they've shifted kind of, they shift ever so slightly in different um, cultures. So there's like the garter toss used to be not a thing. I don't, I don't remember exactly when it became the thing, but it used to be that single men would put their shoes under the bride's dress at one point during the um, reception and then the groom would go and fetch a shoe and that was the next man who was going mm. to get married yeah. um so there's always been kind of these traditions around those kind of superstitions most of what I found actually was related with kind of the accessories that we talked about so I'll have to look a little bit more to see exactly why yeah. the bouquet throwing I don't know when I don't know when that started or why right. <laughs> that's That'd a good question that is a good question um so Megan mentioned in the chat that her grandmother made her wedding dress out of a silk parachute. Very cool. Um, what are some other interesting materials that wedding dresses have been made out of? That's a good question. So silk parachutes were a common thing for um, women, something for women to do, especially during World War II, because you couldn't buy silk because silk was being used for parachutes, but you right. could reuse silk um, that you had found. So one of the interesting things though, is that women are resourceful. Right. <laughs> so like there is, there's a great photograph, um, in another museum collection of a bride in the 1940s, who's wearing basically a, like a house dress robe. So something that we could sit, would consider very much, and even then would consider very much an at-home wear type of okay. dress, but it was white, it was shiny, and it looked nice. It was long right. because it was something that fit within the rations realm that you could have. You couldn't have long day dresses, but you could mm -hmm. have a long nightgown. Right. And so these like home dresses were kind of 
you would see them sometimes as wedding dresses. Right. Um, I'm not sure that I can think of anything that's really necessarily weird that they would be made from, but there's always, um, a lot of this happened around World War II. So there were a lot of new textiles being made in the 1930s and 40s. Um, a lot of our synthetics that we get like polyester and nylon and acetate, all of those are coming about then. Before that, it was really silk, wool, cotton, and linen. Um, mm -hmm. But so in the 1940s, it's actually really interesting because now we think of if you're a sewer, a lot of times you think of acetate as that like nasty, cheap material they use to line coats um, mm -hmm. because it's really cheap and it's super shiny. But in the 1940s, it was a brand new fabric and it kind of looked like silk. It behaved a little bit like silk. It wasn't a perfect match, but if you couldn't get silk, make your wedding right. dress out of acetate. So right. sometimes we see wedding dresses from this period in the 1940s. And as kind of a modern sewer, you're like, oh my God, why would you make your wedding dress out of that? Why would you do that? Because it was new and it was cool. Just like right. how women went crazy and men went crazy for double knit polyester in the 70s because <laughs> it was new and cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whereas now we're like, get that away from me. <laughs> no <interest>. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh gosh. Okay. So Tom and Gail ask, um, could you mention something about men wearing kilts at weddings, but not usually at any other special occasions? They assume that the men have a cultural reason for wearing kilts, but um, there could be more to it. So do you know anything about men in kilts? I know next to nothing about men and kilts. Okay. So I'm going to unfortunately <laughs> defer that question. Um, okay. The, the thing that I do know is that kilts are a traditional dress for men in different areas. So in Scotland, my high school boyfriend wore a kilt to prom because it was it was kind of like their version of a suit. So instead of wearing a tuxedo, they would wear a kilt because that was kind of the nicest thing you had and wore. Right. And kilts are often made out of um, kind of your family's plaid your family's tartan. Oh, it's yep. also not uncommon to see like for if the groom is wearing a kilt that you would see somewhere on the bride, whether it be just a ribbon on her bouquet or a shoulder um, sash, something on her that was that same tartan because she is leaving kind of that same idea of she's leaving behind her family and their tartan and she is entering into the household and family of her husband. Um, mm -hmm. But beyond the fact that kilts are kind of the the tuxedo version I don't I don't know much about the history and tradition of kilts themselves so interesting. that's the that's best interesting thing though <laughs> yeah well I learned something from that so oh, cool. okay um uh, Pamela asks if you could talk about honeymoons and kind of their uh, how they started and the custom behind them all that yes yeah, so honeymoons are um this is actually I I think Reagan planted you because this was one of the questions <laughs> that we had at the end that we didn't get to <laughs> um <laughs> So honeymoons have been a tradition for a long time, but they haven't always been available to everyone. So for instance, in the 19th century, you took a honeymoon, but it was more often referred to as a wedding tour. And it was, I mean, one of the things you have to think about is there are two things that you need to take a honeymoon. You need financial resources and you need time resources. Something that was not available to most people until the early to mid 20th century as the second industrial revolution not just got underway but after the progressive era when workers um were able to actually have like two-day weekends and mm -hmm. have sick time vacation time and things like that um so that's something to consider so a lot of times honeymoons prior to the 19 teens were something that just the elite did because a wedding tour in Europe could last a month or two. And you would visit a bunch of places. And if you were a woman like Consuelo Vanderbilt, you were um, you were presented at court and you would wear your wedding dress then. And you would do that whole shebang. And you would probably in the process go to Paris and have the couturiers make you some new clothes that fit your new lifestyle as a wife, as opposed to, um, a young woman who was looking for a husband. So honeymoons 
are traditional, but it is not until much more recent history that we actually kind of, the idea that every bride and groom can take some kind of honeymoon away is still pretty new. Interesting. Okay. So we know that you are, or had a former life as a textile conservator. Um, <laughs> do you have any tips about preserving your dress, your wedding dress for the future? Yes. So if you are trying to preserve your wedding dress, a um, couple of things to note. One is that dry cleaning, not always the best thing. Um, unless your dress has a stain or really got nasty during the reception, um, dry cleaners are not that, dry cleaning we think of as less harsh than putting it in our washing machine, which is true, but it is less harsh when it comes to water, but it is more harsh when it comes to chemicals. So it all kind of depends. Um, I have never dry cleaned my wedding dress. It is in a box as it was after I got married. Luckily, I didn't spill anything on it. So I didn't have to worry about any of that. And it was a beautiful <laughs> fall day. So it wasn't terribly hot. Right. Um, but if you want to really preserve your wedding dress, I would stay away from the packaging companies, the companies that preserve your wedding dress, unless they specifically say that they are preserving your wedding dress in acid-free, lignin-free materials. Um, the biggest threat to anything white and fabric is acid staining, which happens when acidic wood or acidic cardboard, um, which is all naturally acidic because of the wood pulp that's used to make them, comes into contact with white garments. So when you look at a white garment, if you pull out something, um, even it's happened with like baby doll clothes that are still in my parents' house that are in a cardboard box. Um, you pull them out and there's like all these tiny little brown stains on them. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get those out. There has been a chemical reaction that happened between um, the garment and the fibers that it's made out of and the acid that the wood produced. So you want to look for acid-free, lignin-free boxes. Um, you can get them from a place like Gaylord, maybe Callie, if you want to pop that in the chat, gaylord.com. Um, that's a museum supply company. You can get for like, I want to say it's like $40. You can get an acid-free textile box that has a bunch of acid-free tissue paper. Just fold your wedding dress up nicely, fold anything else up that was important to you. You know, if your husband's tie or whatever it is, put those all in the box wrapped with that acid-free tissue. And that's going to help protect them for a lot longer. Um, you know, I just unboxed, my mom brought me a couple of weeks ago, but well, I guess it's been months now because it was pre-COVID. <laughs> she brought me, I don't know what time it is. Um, right. She brought me her wedding dress because she was like, I know this is something that you want. Your sisters don't care. Um, here's my wedding dress. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you because your father and I are cleaning the attic and we don't want it out there anymore. <laughs> so I just unboxed it and man, like it was like, hours after they left the house, I was like, I am getting that thing out of this acidic box from the 80s and right. this film that was covering so that there was the window that you could see into it. That film is plastic and it's rotting away as we speak. Rip, like mm -hmm. it went into an acid-free box so fast. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, so I would suggest that going to Gaylord or Archival Supply Company and getting the little textile set. It's just a box. And if you really truly want to save your wedding dress, I would advise investing a little bit of money it's probably actually going to cost you less than sending it to one of those fancy like we're gonna package your wedding dress and it'll last right. for 100 years <laughs> or not or not right well your parents probably knew they were leaving their dress in good hands right, right. i think that's why she brought it to me already right <laughs> she's like, like you be you better go. Here than <laughs> okay <laughs> well so we are, too. right <laughs> we are at the end karen thank you so much for one Wonderful presentation. We learned so much today. Um, and I'm gonna hand it off to Callie to close us out. Thank you so much. This was lovely. I learned all about my hypothetical future wedding dress, whenever that. <laughs> so, thank you both so much for, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, just a few more things as we wrap up. Um, if you enjoyed this, we hope you'll come back for more. In two weeks, we're back exploring cemeteries with one of our favorite historians, Jeannie Regan Dinius. And then keep an eye out for more history happy hours on Kurt Vonnegut, World War I, and more. It'll be the same time, same place, new Zoom link.
Um, next Thursday, um, we are hosting a book launch for Dr. James H. Madison and his new investigation on the Ku Klux Klan in the heartland. Um, we hope you join us for the conversation with the author um, and get your own signed copy of the book. And then on October 17th, um, join us for a family history workshop exploring how you can use oral histories to document your family stories. You can find out how to sign up for all of that and so much more at indianahistory.org and to bring programs like this back to an internet connected device near you. If you missed your chance to donate or would like to make a future gift, further gift, sorry, to the Indiana Historical Society, um, please visit the link that Bethany will be dropping into the chat in just a moment. Your donation helps us to continue to share who's your stories and we really appreciate that. You'll get an email from us tomorrow morning that will have all the links that we shared tonight and a survey. It'll take you one whole minute. We'd love to know what you thought and how we can offer events like this in the future and what you wanna hear about in the future because we're planning 2021. It's coming guys, it's coming. Um, this conversation we posted to YouTube in um, the follow in IHS's YouTube in the upcoming week. So keep an eye out on that and on our indianahistory.org website. And with that, stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane. And we can't wait to see you on a future event. Night, everybody.